Greetings from Southern Missouri, United States. My name is C. Anderson, and I am so delighted to be here with you in this Kingdom Ambassadors Conference, where many of you are working on university and high school campuses and sharing Jesus and making disciples. Well, it is really, truly my honor to be here with you today and to have this opportunity to share. So, Thank you very much to Brother Adiolu and others who have invited me to speak with you today. As I said, my name is C. Anderson, or uh, people call me either Cindy, or my Nigerian name is Chinyere. Yes, I have a Nigerian name. Isn't that fun? I was actually born in Jos, Nigeria many years ago. I won't tell you how many years ago, but quite a few. <laughs> My parents were serving as missionaries in Nigeria. So Nigeria and Nigerians are very close to my heart. And I am actually a Nigerian by birth. So I'm so excited to get a chance to connect with you this way today and to bring you a very important topic. Today, we want to talk about in this hour or so that we have together, we want to talk about a uh, need for change. We want to talk about change and how we make and multiply disciples. And I hope I'll be able to present to you a biblical case for change in how we practice disciple making and discipleship in the hopes that we would see greater fruit and greater results in the years to come. So as we get started, let me just say a quick prayer and then we will dive into our topic matter today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the one who gave us the perfect model of how to make disciples. You made 12 disciples who made more disciples who made more disciples. And those 12 and the others who gathered there as you were about to go up into heaven, you gave them the great commission and you told them that they too would go and make disciples and baptize them and teach them to obey your commands. So Lord Jesus, we come to you today with open heart, open ears to hear what you would speak to us today. I pray, Lord Jesus, I would get out of the way and you would take over and that my lips and my mouth would be yours today and you would speak what you desire to speak to my Nigerian brothers and sisters and to others who would listen to this in the future as well. God, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, for the amazing model that you have given us. We pray that you would give us your grace to hear and understand how to walk in your footsteps, how to be led and directed by your Holy Spirit so we could do the works that you've given us to do. For Lord, here on this earth, you said to us in your word that we would do even greater things than what you did. And we receive that by faith in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, let me hear you. <laughs> Amen. Yes, I didn't hear you, but I know you said it. And God bless you for giving me that. Amen as well. Well, I wanted to use some slides to help us. So I'm going to go ahead and put that on and uh, we'll be able to see that on my screen here. There we go. Okay. And let's get this started. So I hope that you can still hear me and still see me. And um, I'll pop the slides on and off, but the title of my message to you today is A Call to Change How We Make and Lord Willing How We Multiply Disciples. This is where we're going today. I'm going to establish a case for change. If we're not ready to change, nothing else I'm going to say to you will have much impact. So I'm going to establish a case for change. We will then talk about methods for change and then some of the practice of what it means to change the way that we make and multiply disciples. Let's start with why change? Why should we change? It seems like things are going well. People are getting saved. People are getting baptized. We're starting groups on campuses all over Nigeria. Why change? I have to ask you these three questions today. Are we satisfied with the discipleship results that we're getting? 
Or is there a holy discontentment, a holy dissatisfaction in your heart that says there has to be a different way? There has to be a way to see greater fruit, to see more people coming to know the Lord Jesus and living the life of a disciple of Christ. We need to ask ourselves that question today. Are we satisfied with the results of our discipleship that we're doing currently? How many of you would say today, and I know I'm not there to see your hand, but you would raise your hand and say, I'm not satisfied. I want something more. Yeah, go ahead and raise your hand if that's you. We need to ask ourselves this question. Does our discipleship, the way we've been doing discipleship, actually address lostness sufficiently? What do I mean by lostness? We need to recognize that people are lost all around us. There are hundreds and hundreds of thousands, millions around us who are dying, going into eternity apart from Christ. They are eternally lost and they live in a lost condition. Does our discipleship models, the ways that we've been making disciple, sufficiently address lostness in our day? We're going to talk more about that. And the third question, is it effective in making obedient disciples who are making disciples? Are our current models of disciple making, are they truly effective in making obedient disciples? Or are we only making converts? right? Are we only making church members? The Great Commission tells us to go and make disciples. What is a disciple? A disciple is someone who follows the way of Jesus. They become like Jesus. They act like Jesus. They talk like Jesus. They are like Jesus. And they look to him as their leader and their master and their lives are transformed. Are we seeing that happen enough? in the way that we're making and multiplying disciples? Are we making obedient disciples whose lives are transformed? Or are we simply filling up buildings with lots of new members, right? We need to think about that question in Nigeria and all over the world. So important. There's a quote that um, I can't even remember who said it, but I've heard it repeated often as we talk about the need for change. Maybe you've heard this quote before. It says, if we keep doing what we've been doing, we will keep getting what we've been getting, right? If we keep doing what we've been doing in discipleship and we keep doing what we've been doing in the way that we're doing church in Nigeria, we will keep getting the results that we've been getting. If we want to see different fruit, if we want to see a new level of revival, if we want to see many, many more people becoming obedient disciples of Jesus, we want different results, my friends. We need to be willing to change, willing to do something differently. Lostness in Nigeria is on the rise, and I'm sure you've heard these statistics before, but Pew Research said this. I just read it this morning. Nigeria's Muslim population is expected to increase by more than 41.1 million from 2010 to 2030 rising from 75.7 million in 2010 to 116.8 million in 2030. This is by far the largest projected increase in sub-Saharan Africa. As noted earlier in this report, Nigeria is projected to become a Muslim-majority country by 20. Now, I'm sure those statistics are not new to you. And they are alarming. They are alarming because population among lost people, Muslims and others, the population growth rate among those people groups, the unreached people of your nation is far more than the evangelical church growth rate. You see what I mean? The growth rate of the church, it is growing, but it's growing at this kind of a rate. Well, you know, Let's say this is the evangelical church. While the Muslim population growth rate 
is like this. It's off the charts. They are multiplying in population, not conversion, but in my population exceedingly rapidly while evangelical church growth rate is quite small and our population growth rate as well. Well, the answer isn't for every evangelical Christian just have lots more babies, right? But we need to get active and serious about reaching lost people and making disciples of them. Amen? Amen? So here's the answer. Instead of an addition growth, addition growth model of disciple making, we must embrace a multiplication model. And I have a chart here for you that I hope will sort of help you what I'm talking about. Now, how many of you, if I said I led 365 people to Christ in one year, say I am a good missionary, would you say that? Would you think that? I'm pretty sure you would think I was a good missionary. You might even want to support me and, you know, help me to do my ministry, right? One new person every single day. If I could lead to Christ, wow, that would be amazing. And you see that over here in the addition model. And then what if I did that again next year? I led another 365 to Christ. Wow, that would be 730 people. And the following year, another 365. And you can see how that addition growth adds up. In 33 years of ministry, I would have 12,045 people that I had led to Jesus Christ. That sounds exciting. How many of us would be happy with that? Yes, we would. But there are millions in Nigeria who do not know Jesus. And an addition model is simply not going to help us address this issue of the rising population rate. We must embrace a multiplication model. So if instead of addition, if instead of leading 365 people to Christ, I led instead two people, but I train those two people how to lead others to Christ. And the next year, those two people led two people to Christ. I also led two more to Christ. We'd then have four. And then if those people trained others how to make disciples, they would also train them and we'd have eight in the third year. Well, that sounds like a lot less than 1,095. But as we embrace a multiplication model, you can see here that the results are amazing, right? We must shift to a multiplication model of making disciples. So again, let me ask you, what was the mission of Jesus? What did he say in his words was his mission? It says in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is after uh, the story of Zacchaeus, where he, he is walking down the road and he sees Zacchaeus up in the tree and he looks up and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to eat at your house today. And he goes to this man's house who is a tax collector. He was lost. He was not one of the acceptable people in the society. But Jesus went to his house. And he told his disciples and those who were questioning why he had done that, he said, my mission, my job is not to heal the, those who are already well, but to go to those who are sick. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Is that our mission? And then what was his not just mission, but the commission that he gave to all of us? He said in Matthew 28, that we were to make disciples of all nations. Make disciples not only of our own people, not only of our own people group, our own tribe, but to make disciples of all tribes, of all nations, of all religious blocks. We are to go and make disciples of them. We are to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and we are to teach them to obey his commands, as it says there in Matthew 28. 
So is his mission our mission? Are we doing what he commissioned us to do? How effective are we? Let's ask ourselves those questions. My friends, again, I repeat, if we want, let's go back to it here and see. If we think what we've been doing, we will keep getting what we've been getting. Are we ready to change? I hope that but as I've been speaking, there's been a holy discontentment that has been rising up in your heart to do something differently. To do something differently. I believe that Jesus is speaking to you today. He has a plan. He has a purpose for you that is far greater than what you've already seen. His plans, his purposes are greater, are bigger. It says in his word that he is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. And he is calling you, my friend, to get involved in change in changing Nigeria for the kingdom of God, in seeing every people group reached with the gospel, in seeing those who don't know him to come to know him and be transformed and become obedient disciples. See, we can't keep doing things the way we've been doing them, or we will not address the issue of lostness in our nation, Nigeria, or around the world. There's a pastor friend of mine, his name's Roy Moran, and he wrote a book called Spent Matches. And in that book, he tells this story. He tells about a dream that he had one night. And I want to share with you this dream. He had this dream of God speaking to him, and he had been praying for revival in his city. He had been asking God to to break out revival that tens of thousands of people, lost people, would come to know the Lord Jesus. And in this dream, he saw this picture of God answering his prayer. He saw that his church was packed with people. It was packed. Every seat was filled. And he had a large church. And he saw that there were people waiting outside and standing in lines. And there was traffic jams on the way to church. And at first, he was really, really excited. He thought, wow, what I've been praying for, it's happening. And then he saw that as people got frustrated with those traffic jams, as people got tired of waiting outside, they began to turn away and they began to go home. And only the people who could actually get into that church building were those who were able to hear the message of Jesus. And my friend Roy, he began to grieve in his heart. Lord, what can we do? We have to do something different. If God were to answer my prayer and people's hearts would be open and they would want to come to my church and hear about Jesus, we can't contain them. What can we do differently? And God began to speak to him about not calling people to come into a church, but taking the gospel out to them, being not a come church, but a go church that would go and make disciples among lost people in their homes, in their workplaces, in their tea shops, in their fields. And little groups of disciples would form in those places, and those would begin to multiply. And as my friend Roy began to see this picture, he saw that what he'd been praying for, it could be possible. Radical multiplication and harvest was only possible if they got the church outside of the building. And he began to look at a new approach, not an addition way of making disciples, but a multiplication way. I want to tell you about another friend of mine, and we'll call him Daniel. That's not his real name. He's from India. And to protect him, I want to protect his identity since I know this will be up online. But Daniel came to a Youth with a Mission, a YWAM training, and he did this discipleship training. And in that training, he heard about the Great Commission. And God challenged him and called him to go and take the good news of Jesus to a, a city where nearby where he had grown up. 
in this city, there were there was a lot of sex trafficking, there was child labor trafficking, there was a lot of alcoholism, there were a lot of problems in this city. And it was mostly a Hindu city. There were also Muslims there, but mostly Hindu and uh, very few Christians in that city. So Daniel and his wife and their new baby, they moved to the city, they rented a little room, and they began to go out and walk in the city every day and pray. They would take their little baby on their shoulder and walk and pray. Every day from 5 a.m. to about 7 a.m., they would just walk and pray and cry out to God to move in the streets of their city, to lead them to someone whose heart would be open to the good news of Jesus. Well, one day they came across this family as they were out. This family was sitting outside of their home and it was hot. And so people like to sit outside on their porches or verandas. And they greeted these people, namaste, and they interacted with them. And, and they came to find out that this couple had a, a daughter who was about 12 years old, a young girl who had been very, very sick. She was weak. She was anemic. They had taken her to many, many doctors. She had a problem with continual bleeding and she was unable to be cured. The doctors couldn't help her. They had taken her to witch doctors as well. The witch doctors couldn't do anything for her and they were desperate for help for their daughter. And so they told my friend Daniel, they said, uh, we desperately need help. Daniel said to them, I serve a God, his name is Jesus, and he has the power to heal the sick. I can't do anything for your daughter, but I can ask Jesus to heal her. Would that be okay? Can I lay my hands on her and pray in Jesus' name? Well, this family were desperate. They agreed. They said, sure, pray for her. And my friend Daniel, he laid his hands on her very gently, and he began to pray in Jesus' name. And within a few moments, the bleeding instantly stopped, and this little girl was completely and powerfully healed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. God is a healing God. He's a miraculous God, and he works through his people when we call on his name. And I, I just believe that so much. So Dan Daniel, he, he did this and he prayed for her. This miracle happened. And then he took the next step of inviting them to learn more about Jesus. He started what we call a discovery Bible study on the veranda, the porch of this home, and began to teach this family about Jesus. And it wasn't long before they received Jesus. Jesus as their Lord and Savior were baptized and became disciples of Jesus. Well, as this was happening, there were others who they were willing to come and hear more about Jesus. And there was another family who lived nearby who had been attending this, this discovery Bible study, learning about the stories of Jesus. And they, they were interested but hadn't yet believed. One day, the mother of this family, who was uh, about my age, in her 50s, she had a heart attack, and she she passed away on the way to the hospital. And the, the husband called up Dan, and he said, Dan, our mama has just passed away. Can your Jesus do anything? Well, how would you like to get that phone call? <laughs> kind of a challenging one, right? But Dan, he did the right thing. He said, I'm on my way. And he jumped on his motorbike and he drove to the house. And when he got there, it was just like a scene out of the New Testament. People were wailing and weeping and the woman's body was in a back room of the home. And Dan, he went into that back room and he shut everyone out of the room. And he got, he saw just the body was there and he got down on his face before God and he began to pray. He cried out to the Lord. He said, Lord Jesus, would you show these people who you are? Would you glorify your name by bringing life back to this woman? Would you do a miracle of resurrection and healing today? And as he prayed his face to the ground, the woman breathed in and began to move. 
Well, Dan was kind of surprised, but he was so grateful. He called the family to come in and he presented the woman to the family alive and to all the people who had gathered there. Well, news spread like wildfire and many, many people came to hear about Jesus and Dan's phone was ringing off the hook. He was getting phone call after phone call to come here and pray and go there and pray. And, and so many people wanted to hear about Jesus. And he started within about two months, he started 12 new house churches, 12 new groups where people were hearing about Jesus. But he had a problem. And at that time, he came to a training that we were running. And he came to the training and he was telling us about this miracle that had happened. He was telling us about the many new groups that had started. It was addition growth. He was starting all these groups. He was leading all these people to Christ. And he said, but Cindy, I have a problem. Chinere, I'm so exhausted and my phone rings all the time and I have no time to rest and my family has no, none of my time. I hardly ever see my wife and my children anymore. What should I do? It's a good problem, but not for long. If that kind of problem continues, you're going to burn out, right? And so we talked to our friend Daniel. We said, Daniel, what you need to do is you need to go back and you need to train all of those people who've come to Christ, every single disciple, train them to do what you do. Don't become the big shot who leads this big healing ministry. No, that will not lead to reaching your people group and reaching your region for Christ. Instead, what you need to do is you need to train every one of them to pray for the sick. You need to train them to also start groups of disciples. Train them how to tell the stories of Jesus and how to make disciples. Train them how to baptize people, how to do what you've been doing. Because because if you keep doing it all, it's going to be limited in its scope of how far it can reach. And there are so many millions in your area who still don't know Jesus. And so Dan, he took that to heart. He said, I see that in the Bible. I see Jesus doing that. He left and went to heaven and he commissioned his disciples and they went and did the work in the ministry. He didn't just keep doing the ministry all himself, but he empowered others and he trained disciples to make disciples. And I want to do that same thing. And so Dan went back, a changed man. And he went back and began to do that. And things began to grow and multiply. And those groups Groups of disciples, those first 12 groups, they started new groups of disciples. And then those new groups started new groups. And those new groups started new groups. And beyond, there were three or 4,000 followers of Jesus in that unreached area. And things began to change in the society. And those who were trafficking the children no longer could traffic them because so many people were following Jesus and learning how valuable their children were. And they weren't selling them into trafficking anymore. And transformation of the society also came. Can you say glory to God? This is what we call a disciple making movement. And I believe with all my heart, God wants to do this kind of thing in Nigeria as well, that we would see many, many new disciple making movements spreading out and sweeping through our nation of Nigeria. Let's go back to the slides and let me uh, share with you a little bit more here. All right. There we go. Okay, so here's another option that we are presented with. We can start disciple making movements. Now, what is a disciple making movement? Let me make that clear. Here you see a picture of a rabbit and an elephant. Well, let me ask you, what's the difference between a rabbit and an elephant? Turn to your neighbor for just a minute and describe to them the difference between a rabbit and an elephant. Go ahead. Talk to your neighbor for just a minute. What's the difference between these two animals?
All right. Well, I heard some of you, <laughs> I didn't actually hear you, but I can imagine that some of you said things like rabbits are small and elephants are big, right? Or rabbits can hide under a bush while elephants cannot hide easily. They're very loud and you know they're there when they're there, right? Did any of you talk about reproduction capacity or ability and the difference between rabbits and elephants? Anyone talk about that? Yeah? Rabbits can produce way more babies than elephants, right? A, a two rabbits together, a male and female, can have not just one new rabbit, but they can have a whole a whole group of rabbits, right? They, when they have a baby, when a, a mama rabbit has a baby, she has about eight or 10 baby rabbits. And when those rabbits grow up, those eight or 10, they have another eight or 10, and they have another eight or 10. And it doesn't take very long. It's only about four months from when a rabbit is born until they can produce more rabbits, right? Very different reproduction capacity. Now, an elephant in its whole lifetime can only produce a maximum of four baby elephants, right? They don't produce a lot of new elephants. And that baby elephant, it takes a long time, many, many years. I think it's over 20 years before they can produce another elephant. And then they usually only have one baby at a time. So how quickly they reproduce more and make more rabbits or more elephants is very, very different. And we say we want to start rabbit disciple making groups, rabbit churches, not elephant churches. And especially when we're working with people of other cultures and other religious, religious backgrounds, we don't want to do something that's big and demonstrative because, you know, an elephant Elephant is easy to, to shoot, easy to spot, and easy to hear, but a rabbit, rabbits are harder to catch, and they multiply rapidly. In fact, we I just recently read about a rabbit infestation in New Zealand, I think it was, or Australia, where one set of rabbits was brought in, and within a very short number of years, the entire countryside was filled with rabbits. It, it spread organically and it spread rapidly. And we want to see that happen with disciples of Jesus. That is what happens in a disciple making movement. We start rabbit churches, not elephant churches, and they grow and multiply rapidly. And before long, they can dramatically change the nature of things in that region, in that area. So here's four important characteristics. Disciple making movements are fast growing. They don't grow slowly, they grow rapidly. They are indigenous. That means they are of the local culture. They use local money, not outside money. Um, if you're going to build a big, huge church, a lot of times you have to bring in money from outside. Not so with rabbit churches that meet in tea shops and fields and under a tree. They are locally led by local people who are of that culture, of that tribe, of that religious background. So uh, they're indigenous. They multiply. Remember, I showed you the chart of addition and multiplication growth. They multiply and they are obedience based. So they are. there's a strong emphasis in disciple making movements on ob immediate obedience to whatever we learn in God's word which is quite different from how we normally disciple people, where we focus on teaching them, knowing a lot of things, but not necessarily keeping them accountable to obey and put it into practice in their lives. Here, we want to move on to some mindsets that we must change. If we want to see different results, if we want to see that that curve of the church and of the growth of disciples to match population growth and even exceed it. Here are some things that need to change in the way we think about making and multiplying disciples. And I'm going to go through these quickly. I would encourage you to take my course on getting started in disciple making movements. If you're interested to go deeper on some of these topics or talk to Adiolu 
and he knows more about this. He's taken my course and been mentored by me. So uh, you can talk with him further. But the first mindset change I want to just touch on is the priesthood of all believers versus the stage on this, the sage on the stage kind of pastoring, right? We need to recognize that in the New Testament model, every believer is commissioned by Jesus to do the work of the ministry. In the Old Testament model, we see that there were, there were the priests, the Levites, and then there were the ordinary Jewish people. And it was the priest who did the work of the ministry. In the New Testament, that all shifted. When Jesus died on the cross. The curtain was torn. Yeah, the curtain was torn and every person has equal access to God. We can come in before his throne of grace. We can have a living relationship with God ourselves. And he has commissioned us, every one of us, to be his royal priest. As it says in 2 Peter, that you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You have been given the ministry of the gospel. And yet so often we don't, we don't train ordinary believers to do the work of the ministry instead. And a lot of this, I'll take responsibility for it as an American. And our American model is being exported around the world of these megachurch pastors who are up on the stage. And they are the great leader with, with great wisdom. And they do all the ministry and the local ordinary person doesn't. This is not in the New Testament, my friends. We do not see Paul. We don't even see Jesus doing that, putting himself up on a stage. Instead, we see him training disciples and sending them out that they too could train other disciples. We must embrace the priesthood, the call to ministry of every believer if we want to see disciple-making movements take place. Amen. Are you tracking with me? Are you with me there? The next is we need to believe that the harvest is ripe among the unreached versus thinking that the lost are hopeless cases. Now, especially when we talk about people from other religious communities, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, often we think, oh, it's so hard to see them come to Jesus. Or even when we think about those who are, say, uh, in addiction to drugs or alcohol, we think, oh, it's so hard to reach them. Well, Jesus addressed this when he said, he said, the harvest is ripe. Can you repeat it with me? But the, yep, let me hear you. The laborers are few. The harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into the harvest field. Now, is he talking about people who've done Bible college and seminary and full-time pastors? No, he's talking about the priesthood of all believers. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out the laborers into the harvest field. Jesus said, don't say four more months until harvest. He said, raise up your eyes, look to the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Would you say with me, the harvest is ripe? Go ahead and say it out loud. The harvest is ripe. Amen. The harvest is ripe in Nigeria. There are many, many, many people who are ready to hear the good news of Jesus and receive it if you simply are willing to learn how to explain the gospel in a way that they can understand and be the go church, not the come church. They may never come into your church building, but if you will go to them, the harvest in the fields is indeed ripe. We also need to change our mindset about what is the church. The church is a building versus the church is people in community together, obeying Christ. The church, my friends, is not a building. In the New Testament, we see in Acts chapter 2, they met from house to house to house. Where did the church meet? They met in homes. They didn't even have buildings. They had some synagogues and they met there as well, but they met in homes, house to house, and they broke bread together and they heard the apostles teaching 
in homes all across Jerusalem and Judea, and then it spread into Samaria and other parts of the world. The church is not a building. The church is people, and we need to take the church outside of the building and activate it. We need to make a shift from making disciples to making disciple makers and from teaching knowledge to training trainers until they can train others. Jesus in the Great Commission said, he said, go make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then he said, and teach them to obey. He said, teach them to obey everything I have commanded. So many times, my friends, we think that we're to teach them what the commands are instead of teach and train them to actually obey those commands. Are we training people to know what the Bible says or are we training people to do what the Bible says? We need to change our mindset from teaching knowledge to training trainers and not just training them, but training them until they too are able to train others. So I hope this is making some sense to you. Um, let me just exit from here and touch base for just a minute. Are you tracking with me? Okay, yes. Good to see you guys again. I hope you're seeing my picture there with the slides, but I just wanted to jump back on and be full screen for a moment. What stood out to you? I want to just pause, and I often do this when I'm training. I want you to talk to your neighbor for a moment. What are you hearing me say? What are some of the mindsets, the ways of thinking that need to change if we're going to see multiplication of disciples and disciple-making movements take off? Go ahead. I'm going to just sit here for a moment and let you talk. You talk to your neighbor. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor for just a moment and tell them, what do you hear me saying about what needs to change? Make sure both people get to talk. If you're in pairs, go ahead and switch. Let the other person answer. What needs to change? What are you hearing me say? Just two more minutes. Keep talking. Okay, just 30 seconds more, wrap it up.
Amen. Amen. Well, I know that all of you have had great insights as you've talked about this with your neighbor. I wish I was there if I was there in person on you to hear what those things are that you had fresh revelation and fresh insights as we talk about the difference between addition and multiplication of disciples and what mindsets need to shift, what ways of thinking need to shift if we are going to see multiplication take place. Well, I want to move on in the 15 minutes that we have together, and I want to talk about some of the methods that need to change as well. There are some really important key methods that need to change as we look at seeing disciple-making movements take place. <clears throat> what are some of those methods that need to change? The first is a shift from simple or a shift to simple and reproducible methods instead of complex and expensive methods. Often we talk about this as carrying a light baton. You know the verse in 2 Timothy 2.2 where Paul is talking to his disciple Timothy and he says to him, he says, the things which you have heard and seen in me entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. We see Paul talking to Timothy and saying, give, pass on, pass on what I've given to you. Pass it on to others. Pass it on to others who will then, who are faithful and will then pass it on to others. But in order for us to pass something on, it has to be simple and it has to be light, right? If we have a big, huge, heavy baton, it's not easy to pass. How many of you have ever seen a baton race, right? It's a kind of race that runners run and one runner runs. I'm a runner myself and I love running, but I've never run a baton race. But one runner runs and they take that baton, that stick, and they pass it to the next runner who grabs a hold of it and then they run and then they pass it to the next and they run. Making disciples <coughs> is like a baton race. But in order for us to pass on those things, like it says in 2 Timothy 2, 2, they must be simple and reproducible. When we make massive, when we make things complex, when we make our presentation of the gospel too difficult, when we, we make things heavy, we're not able to pass them on to others. And so we need to simplify our the way that we make disciples. It doesn't have to be complicated. You don't need this big, huge training manual. You just need the Bible and a very simple method of learning how to ask questions as you do a discovery Bible study. Then another shift in our method is from discovery. We want to shift to discovery instead of telling or preaching. And in most disciple-making movements around the world, there's a very simple discovery process where we read the passage, we repeat it, we tell it in our own words, and then we ask discovery questions of the people who are there. We, we get them to participate. We want it to be participatory because adults actually learn best when they discover things for themselves rather than when they are taught and told what is the truth, okay? They need to discover truth from God's word. And we trust the Holy Spirit that he will speak to people as we ask these simple discovery questions. Questions like, what do we learn about God? What do we learn about people? And how will we obey? And who will we share this story with? These are some of the questions that we ask in a discovery Bible study. So instead of telling and preaching at people, we allow them to discover truth from scripture in a discovery Bible study. That's another method that needs to change. Now, how many of you are preachers? I'm a preacher. Obviously, I'm here preaching to you, right? I love preaching and some of us love to preach but it is not the best way to make disciples. We wanna make disciples who will make disciples in simple reproducible ways. And that means we get really good at telling stories and we get really good 
asking questions and letting people talk, just like I just let you talk. And as you talked about what I'd been saying, it went deeper into your heart and into your memory. And you're much more likely not only to remember it, but to be able to teach it to someone else. Okay, so discovery instead of teaching and preaching. Then we want to shift from lectures to stories, using stories. How many sermons do you think Jesus preached? Think about it for a minute. How many sermons did Jesus preach? Yeah, between three to five sermons we find in the book, you know, in the Bible, in the Gospels that Jesus preached. The Sermon on the Mount is one of them. Now, how, how many stories or parables did Jesus tell? Yeah, there's between 50 to 60 stories that are recorded in scripture that Jesus told. Jesus told stories a lot more than he preached sermons. And I want to be like Jesus, don't you? Amen. We want to be like Jesus. We want to be people who are great storytellers. A short story that can be memorized and repeated and retold to other people is going to spread like wildfire through a community. Well, a sermon is very hard to remember. I doubt that unless you guys get a download of this PowerPoint, most of you will be able to reproduce it, right? And so on your college educated university, you know, people, but Think about the average local person in a slum community or in a village. Stories resonate with all of us. And when we tell stories, it touches the heart. I bet you won't remember all these points I'm giving you, but you will remember the story about Daniel, right? Stories are so helpful in communicating truths. And Jesus used way more stories than he did lectures. So this is a method we need to be willing to change. And then we need to start rabbit groups that will multiply instead of only aiming for elephant models that won't multiply. Um, you know, I am not against the megachurch. And if some of you here who are listening are megachurch pastors, I want you to know I'm not against what you're doing. I believe it's a valid church model. But I don't believe it's going to reach and address the need of lostness in Nigeria adequately. And I don't see that model in scripture. It's not a wrong model, but we need to evaluate our models in light of scripture and in light of effectiveness because lostness is a real problem that we must address. And how will we reach them? How will we address them? We'll address them through starting small groups that multiply and start other groups and training ordinary believers, empowering the priesthood of every believer to make and multiply disciples instead of building big elephant churches and gathering gathering all kinds of members into these churches where they hear a message, they go home and they forget about it and their life is not changed. This is a real problem. Forgive me, my friends, for confronting it today. I hope you have the grace to hear that I speak with love for my brothers and sisters and for my nation of Nigeria. I stand with you as a born and born Nigerian saying we must be willing to do something different if we want to address the issue of lostness. Can I hear an amen? Are we willing to not just look for elephant churches as our model, but to look at how we can start groups that will start groups that will start groups and they will multiply rapidly like rabbits and they will spread into every community and every corner of Nigeria and beyond in the coming years. Not one church or group, not one big one, but many small groups. And I have here a chart that I wanted to show you. This is a real chart from a team that we worked with in India. And these are what we call the first generation groups. They met in homes. You know, they're in between 10 and 20 people in each of these groups. These were started by the church planners, these five groups. But then these five groups started other groups. 
And these were ordinary believers. They were not church planners. They were not YWAM missionaries. They were ordinary people who started new groups. And then those groups started groups. And those groups started groups. And when we have four generations of groups with at least 500 believers who are baptized, we say a movement has begun in that area. And that often grows into 10 generations, 20 generations, until it's almost uncountable and tens of thousands of people are coming to faith in Jesus. Do you want to see that happen in Nigeria? Do you want to see that happen in your area? Well, let me close by talking about how do we change. If we want to see change, and I hope I've made an adequate case for change here today, how do we change? There needs to first be repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is when you choose to turn and go in a different direction. Are you willing to acknowledge today that we have not been adequately fulfilling the commission of Jesus? He sent us to go and not make church members and not fill up buildings with bodies. He sent us to go and make disciples and to baptize them and teach them to do what? To know his commands, yes, but not only that, but to also obey his commands. Would you say today, I repent, I recognize today that I have not been obeying Jesus' commission. I have not let his mission to seek and save the lost be my mission, but I want to change today. Today, I repent. I turn in a new direction. The first step, my friends, is repentance. The second step is to study the New Testament model, to study the books, to study the epistles. How did Paul plant churches? How did Paul make disciples? How did Jesus make disciples? They are our models, my friends. And everything we do needs to be done in the same way that they did it if we want to be fruitful. We need to abide in Jesus, abide in his word, absorb his ways and follow the way of Jesus in disciple making and we will see great fruit. And then the third thing I want to challenge you to do is to learn by doing. You need to just get started. These things that I've been talking about are not learned in a classroom. They're not learned in a textbook. They are learned by doing. And you need to find a group of friends, say, let's try it together. Let's experiment with new ways of working. Let's study the Bible and how did Jesus make disciples. Let's dig into the book of Acts and discover with one another <coughs> the model that we find in the New Testament. If you're interested to learn more about how to make and multiply disciples, how to start a disciple-making movement, I wanted to put this up on the screen. My website is dmmsfrontiermissions.com. You can follow me on social media, the same DMMS Frontier Missions on Facebook, on Instagram, um, on Twitter. We're on all the different social media, TikTok. You can look for us there. And if you're interested to take the course, go to courses.disciplemakersincrease.org. And Brother Adelou can also give you that information. As we close today, I want to pray for you, my beloved brothers and sisters there in Nigeria. And I want to just repeat again that I'm not in any way condemning anyone for the ways that you've worked in the past. But when God brings fresh revelation, we need to respond to it and say, yes, Lord, I want to change. I'm willing to change. So if you're here today and you would say something that you talked about, Chinure, something you talked about, C. Anderson, has struck my heart and I sense the Holy Spirit calling me to do things differently, to be different in the way I make disciples, then I want you just to pray this prayer with me as we close. Lord Jesus, thank you that you were the perfect disciple maker. You came here to earth, you grew up as a human, and then when you began your ministry, you called the disciples to come and follow you. 
and you walked with them and you ate with them and you, and you trained them and then you sent them out to go and make disciples. You said that in Luke chapter 10, that they should go into the areas where you were about to visit and they should go there and they should proclaim your good news. Uh, the good news of your kingdom, and they should heal the sick, and they should cast out demons, and they should find the person of peace and stay with them and until that whole town and that whole village would come to know you. Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters as they have been convicted today by your spirit of the I pray, oh God, that you would use them to release tens of thousands of new people in Nigeria. Nigeria. I pray, oh God, for many new moves through them. I pray, God, that you would bring movements in the Hindu communities, in the Muslim communities, Lord, in the tribal indigenous communities, that you would bring uh, movements among the rich. You'd bring movements among the poor in the slums. You would bring movements, Lord, in these student communities and universities and high schools that these students as they grow up and they graduate from school they would go back to their their workplaces they would go back to their families and they would lead many others to Christ and Lord through them disciples would be equipped to make more disciples groups would start groups and we would see tens of thousands of rabbit churches sweeping across Nigeria for your namesake God Lord, I thank you that you love Nigeria. You love the Nigerian people. They are such gifted evangelists. They are such gifted, anointed disciple makers, Lord. As they embrace change, would you do amazing, impossible things through them? And we'll give you glory and we'll give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Again, uh, we'd love to hear hear from you. Feel free to reach out to me if you've got things or things that you'd like me to respond to. And I'm happy to, uh, to interact with you by email or in other ways. God bless you guys. I hope one day I can visit Nigeria again and perhaps meet some of you. And until then, have a wonderful rest of your conference. God bless.